Joe Dumars. I'll be showing you how to play the shooting guard position. The first thing is the stance. You want to have your knees bent, your arms like this, your hands out, and you're in a balanced position right now. Either way that you have to go, you're in a position to make that move. If you want to go to your left, you're ready to go. If you want to go to your right, you're ready to go. If you want to back up, you're ready to go. And obviously, if you want to go forward, you're in a position to go. One thing that drive uh, coaches crazy is that when you're standing straight up on the basketball court, coaches go absolutely crazy about this. Uh, when you're in this position on offense, they always say, you're not ready to do anything. When you're in this position on defense, you're not ready to do anything. So the proper stance always on the basketball court is like this. Knees bent, head up, chest up, you're ready now. This is called a triple threat position. It's called a triple threat position because you have three options right now. Your knees are bent, you're on the balls of your toes, and the ball is right here. The defender is guarding you. Triple threat position. You're in a position right now to dribble, to pass, or to pull up and take a jump shot. All pivoting is, is determining what foot is stationary. Now this is my pivot foot right now. I can move this leg, this foot, anywhere I want to because this is my pivot foot. The minute I pick this foot up and don't dribble the ball, that's called traveling. So now I come to a jump stop. Let's say I want this to be my pivot foot. I can do this all day long and it's not traveling. You cannot change your pivot foot. You can't jump stop, start pivoting like this, and then decide, oh, I want this to be my pivot foot. Once you determine a pivot foot, that's it. Now, I know a lot of guys in the NBA change their pivot foots and the refs don't call it. But you can't <laughs> change pivot foots. One pivot foot and that's it. Dribbling with the palm of your hand. Absolutely a no-no. You cannot dribble the ball with the palm of your hands. You have to dribble the ball with your fingertips. Palm of your hand dribble. Have a hard time controlling the ball. Even after I've played for so many years, it's almost impossible for me to control the ball dribbling with the palm of my hand. Now, the fundamental right way to do it. Fingertips. I can feel the ball with my fingertips. When I'm dribbling like this, I can't really feel the ball. I'm just kind of slapping at it. But with my fingertips, I can feel it. I can move the ball around. I can control it. Be able to dribble with both hands. It doesn't do you any good to, to dribble great with this hand and then get to the left hand and go back to the bad ways. This way this way. I'm ha I have my head up and I'm not looking down at the ball. The minute you do that, someone steals the ball from you. You have to keep your head up, keep your chest up, and know where everybody is on the court at the same time. Just have a protective leg up. The reason I call it a protective leg is it protects the ball from the defender. You don't want to have this leg up and dribbling with the ball like this. The ball is totally exposed and you're gonna get the ball stolen. You have to protect the ball with this leg up, ball here, and keep the ball low. The crossover dribble is a dribble that's used a lot now in the NBA to set guys up to either make a great move to get a jump shot or to make a great move to get to the basket. Basic move is you're coming at a guy and you see him standing there and you're dribbling the ball and you're dribbling towards the defender and he's there and you want to set him up. What you start doing is maybe leaning one way. Obviously the way that you're not going to go, that's the way that you're going to lean. So if I'm coming at you, I'm going to start leaning this way. I'm going to start leaning that way and start getting you to lean that way. Totally to try to set you up to cross over. Either cross over in front of me or between my legs. Third way you can cross over is a behind the back dribble. So when you're coming at a guy, you're leaning one way, you're trying to set him up. That's crossover just right in front of you. When you're dribbling up the court and the guy's all over you playing tough defense, 
The simplest thing to do is to dribble to a spot, let him cut you off, spin, go to the next spot, spin, and get up the court that way. You run at about half speed, and you know the guy's gonna cut you off, and you want him to cut you off. Guy cuts you off, cut you off right here. You spin, go the other way. Cut you off again. Spin, go the other way. This is when you leave the ball hanging out there. When you go to turn and you put that ball in your left hand like that, if you leave it out there, that's when you see guys steal the ball. What you want to do is keep the ball low and pull it around so you can protect the ball from the defender. If a guy cuts me off, watch what I do with the ball to make sure that he can't get his hand on the ball when I spin. And the reason it's called a rocket dribble is because of the way the ball is just kind of rocking in your hand back and forth. This is basically what's called a rocket dribble. I'm rocket dribbling, and the defensive guy, he makes a step towards me as he's going to steal the ball or, or come up very tight on me defensively. And this is what I'm looking to do when he does that. Let's say I blew by him the first time. Well, the next time I start rocket dribbling, in his mind, he's thinking, I better not get too close this time. The guy just went by me. So I'm going to give the guy some space. I'm looking for that, too. As soon as he does that, I'm looking to pull up and take the jump shot. Ball is gone. I take the jump shot. And that's where all the rocker step is. The rocker dribble is dribbling the ball and reading the defensive guy. You catch the ball, guy gets right in your face. Simply put, back up on the guy. Create some space for yourself. The way to create space for yourself is simply put the ball right here, dribble the ball, put this arm up, and slide back. Don't cross your feet when you slide back. Just slide back like this. Then you can turn and attack. Then you can turn and get into that rocker position where you can attack that guy. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Then you can turn and attack the guy. But first, you have to create space for yourself. Joe Dumars III was born in 1963 and grew up in Natchitoches, Louisiana. His father, Joe Dumars Jr., was a truck driver who had served under George Patton in World War II. My father was um, one of those, uh, what I feel, great men from back in an era where uh, right is right and wrong is wrong. And, and you know, son, you're either going to do it right or you're going to do it wrong. There's no in between. There are no shortcuts. Big Joe Dumars lived by a simple, strict work ethic, and he demanded that his children do the same. But like many kids, little Joe often tried to slack off. I'd go to school sometimes, fake sickness. Oh, my stomach is hurt, <laughs> you know? And, and I would do every, I would do anything to get out of school, to get out of work. Uh, you know, if I had to cut the grass, uh, oh man, the mower is not, it's not working, Dad. Did you put some gas in it? <laughs> Uh, no, okay. <laughs> so I mean, I tried to get away with anything I could get away with, just to get out of whatever I could. But by the time he was a teenager, Joe had learned an intolerance for excuses that would help shape his life. I start realizing that, you know what, I'm wasting time with these excuses because the time I'm doing, making excuses, I could be doing what I have to do and getting it over with. And uh, finally, when I got to that point, it was easy. As a child, Joe Dumars watched his older brothers excel at organized sports, and he couldn't wait until it was his turn to play. The dream of being a professional athlete came from, from being around my older brothers. They were all uh, exceptional athletes. Uh, they were all very good at what they did. Uh, I was very young and an athlete myself, and I just grew up saying I want to be as good as my brothers are. When Joe Dumars was the starting tailback on his undefeated junior high school team, the coaches were predicting great things. Because I had five older brothers who were all just awesome football players. And 
when you're the youngest, you're always trying to make your mark. You're always trying to trying to stand out in some type of way because you're, you're just almost the runt of the family. You're the youngest one, and that's it. And I just felt like, you know what, if I can make it in another sport, um, I can establish my own personality because there's no, no matter what I would have done in football, uh, no matter what I would have accomplished, uh, I had five older brothers who had already did it. On the junior varsity basketball team at Natchitoches Central High, Joe found a sport he could call his own. My senior year uh, in high school, uh, we won our conference championship. And um, uh, I always think everything is relative. As I think back about those times now, that was the biggest thing for me. You know, for us to win the conference championship and beat the other teams in your conference. After a standout performance in high school, Joe Dumars was not a hot national prospect, but he was heavily recruited by several local schools. One of those schools was McNeese State University. I was working after school at this place, uh, at this fast, fast food place, and uh, I was working in there one evening, and uh, these, these coaches came in, and they saw me working there, and they saw me walking through, and they said, hey, how you doing? And I took their hands, and they said, I said, uh, I'm just, no, I, didn't, I didn't introduce myself. They introduced themselves as some college coaches, and they were in town, and uh, they, um, they said, yeah, we're in town to see this guy, to see this guy play. I said, oh, you are? And uh, I said, who, who are you here to see? They said, we're here to see Joe Dumars. So I said, oh, OK. Said, so what are you thinking of him? Do you think he can play or what? And they said, yeah, we think he's really good. I said, well, you guys want to sign him? You know, for the scouts, they said, yeah, we'd love to. We don't know if we're going to get him or not, but uh, we'd love to sign him. And I said, oh, OK, well, that's great. So I went on. And uh, this was at night, and uh, the next day they were coming to watch me practice and stuff. And uh, the next day, they came in the gym, and uh, coach called me over and introduced me, and they were like, oh my God. You know? So I ended up signing with those guys, I don't know. They told me they wanted me, even though they didn't even know it was me, so I felt pretty good about that and said, I think I'll go with these guys here. When it comes to shooting, there's no exact perfect way to start shooting the ball. Uh, you shoot the ball and you do what's most comfortable for you. There are guys who bring the ball way back here. There are guys who shoot out here. There are guys who shoot here. There are guys who shoot push shots from here. And they're all great shooters. So there's not any one particular way to shoot the ball. It's whatever is most comfortable for you. What's most comfortable for me is to bring the ball from right here to right here. I'll show you the set shot and I'll show you the jump shot and you'll see that the mechanics are exactly the same. Right foot starts back, moves forward. My motion to shoot is all in one with my right leg. My right leg, when it's back, the ball is somewhat back. When I'm coming forward, my right leg, the ball is coming forward. It's all connected. It's all one. So the set shot, I come and shoot it. The jump shot, I come and I jump. But the mechanics are exactly the same. Ball's back, right leg's back. Foot forward, ball is forward. Mechanics don't change. End results should not change. The ball should go through the basket. Three point shot. A lot of people take those shots. Uh, it's one of the most exciting shots in basketball. Uh, it can turn a game around, it can change the momentum, it can get a team back into the game. Three-point shot is a vital part of the game today. Usually if a big guy is posting up, what you want to do is be behind the three-point line so when you pass it in to him, if your guy's going to go back and help on defense, he has a long way to go. But if you're in here and you pass the ball, that guy can turn, take two steps, and he's right there helping out. So the three-point line is your barometer. Now, this is the high school line right here, this blue line right here. I only wish that this was my three-point line and I could shoot from behind it all the time, but it's not, it's the high school line. Uh, this has been the NBA line at some point, and this is what it is right now. Um, 
Actually, I think this is about 23 feet away from the basket, 23.9, actually. Uh, it's a good ways from the basket, but if you're a good long-range shooter, it's a shot that you want to shoot. It's a shot that you want to set up for. I try to always get one step, one full step behind the three-point line, because if I catch the ball behind the three-point line and I want to shoot, I want to be able to catch it and take a step and shoot. If I'm right here on the line, I can't take a step and shoot. I'm inside the three-point line. So I always try and get about a step behind the three-point line so when a guy passes me the ball, I can catch it, jump up, and shoot it, and get my full step in. Three-point shot. The free throw. Free throws are basically just that. They're the only free shots that you get in basketball, and it's a shame and a sin when you miss it. Usually, when you see guys on the free throw line, and they do different things, one time you may see them dribble twice, one time you may see them dribble three times, one time it may be once, those are usually your inconsistent free throw shooters. If your ritual is consistent, usually your shooting is gonna be consistent. If, you're, if your ritual is inconsistent, there's no way that you're gonna be a consistent free throw shooter. So my whole thing is get to the line, get into the same mode every time, do the same exact thing every time. Usually what I do is I turn, I get to the line, and I, and I look at the basket first. The first thing I do is I, I try to find the basket and I try to get exactly even with the basket. I want my, my nose to be right with the middle of the front of the basket. So I turn and I look and I, um, I get right to the basket. I put my nose right to the basket. And then what I do is I usually take three dribbles and that's it. Three quick dribbles, I get set, take a deep breath, and usually I let it go. State is about two hours away from where I grew up, and it's um, it's a school of about 10,000 students, uh, mid size, mid to small size, uh, Division One school, and uh, it was a great time. Coach Glenn Duhan promised Dumars that he would be a starter from day one. Joe fit perfectly into Duhan's style of basketball: pressure on defense, fast striking offense, and a quick transition. He wanted guys who always thought pass first, shoot. 15th, not not even second. I mean, he wanted guys just to just to push the ball up the court as fast as they can and really pass the ball. And uh, it was great for me because I was a shooting guard. He scored 891 points in 31 games, the second highest in school history and sixth in the nation. That summer, he was invited to the Olympic trials. I remember getting cut, and all of the guys who were on the bus with me. Uh, who got cut the same day I got cut, and we were all leaving because we had not made the team. And uh, I specifically remember myself, Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, um, it was John Stockton. It was about five or six pretty good players, and I always remember that, that we were all just like, <laughs> and, uh, and we were all laughing, actually. Basically, we all said, we'll see. We'll see in the end what happened. McNeese won 14 of its last 18 games to finish second in the Southland Conference. We never quite gelled completely, uh, but it, like I said, we had good teams, good guys, and guys I enjoyed playing with. Joe finished his college career as an All-American and was far and away McNeese's all-time leading scorer with 2,607 points. I flew to Cleveland and visited the Cleveland Cavaliers. I flew to Dallas and visited the Dallas Mavericks, and I went to Houston and visited the Houston Rockets. Uh, never once did I visit Detroit, even speak to anybody from Detroit. Nobody was more surprised than Joe Dumars when the Detroit Pistons took him with their 18th pick in the first round of the 1985 NBA Draft. Uh, what were my feelings when the Pistons took me in the first round? This is miserable. Why am I going to Michigan? <laughs> My basic idea was they make cars there. They don't play basketball there. So uh, I did not want to go. I wasn't happy about it, to say the least. Joe started his first NBA season on the bench, watching and learning. I knew eventually 
Uh, I would get my break. I just didn't know if it was going to be a short period of time, a long period of time, but I knew eventually I would. And um, uh, fortunately for me, it didn't take that long. Joe watched the Pistons struggle through an early season slump, losing 15 of 19 games. We lost, I'm not sure, but several games in a row. And we just weren't playing well. Uh, Chuck Daly took that opportunity to put me in the lineup. Immediately, we started winning. I think we won 10 games in a row. And the team's winning record solidified Joe as part of the Pistons' new starting five. I was strictly out there trying to help us win games. And I think over a period of time, all the players, the coaches, and everybody came to, to respect that. And even the guys whose place I took, uh, who I've become very good friends with now, they eventually uh, realized that that was my main goal out there. If he would have gone to a team that wasn't quite as good, he would have averaged at least five, six, seven more points a game and been so-called the man. But Joe's willing to accept that. Bottom line is, get the ball to the guy where he can do something with it. You don't want an ankle pass, you don't want a pass where the guy's having to catch it over his head or reach way out here. Bottom line is, get the ball to the guy in a good position. Chest pass, just extend your hands out right to the guy. Try to get the ball right to his chest, to his stomach area right here. That's a basic chest pass, the most basic pass of all passes in basketball. Same fundamentals, same basic principle, but you just bounce the ball. You still have to make sure when you bounce the ball, though, that it bounces up to the guy in the same area, in the chest and stomach area. You don't want to pass it like this. You don't want to pass it like this. You want to pass the ball where it comes right to the guy, he catches it, he can do something with it. It's a pass that looks exactly like you're throwing a baseball. You want to make this pass, usually a, a guard, someone like myself, I get the ball, I get the rebound, or I someone outlets the ball to me and I catch it and I want to get it up the court real fast, usually what I'll do is catch it and throw a baseball pass to get it up early. Right now I want to talk about feeding the post. Feeding the post is when you have a big guy posted up, you're on the perimeter, and you have to throw the ball inside to him. It's tough to pass the ball straight into the post-up guy when you have a defender on you and his hands are up. The guy's gonna hit the ball every time. He's gonna get his hands on the ball. You can't just stand here and say, I'm gonna pass it here. The guy's gonna get his hands on the ball. You have to look at your big guy. I see my big guy, he gives me a post-up position. It's my job to create a lane for myself, a passing lane, second, and secondly, get the ball to him where he can do something with it. First of all, to create the passing lane, take one dribble. Then drop the ball in, bounce pass, Right to my great guy, he turns and he makes his move. Let's say my big guy wants the ball on the other side. Create the passing lane first. One dribble, bounce it right into the guy. He makes his move. Big guy wants the ball, he wants it straight in. He has both hands up, throw me the ball. My job, back up, take one step back, throw the ball in. The reason I take one step back is because when the guy is on me, harder to make the pass with the guy right on it. Create some space for yourself. Now you can drop the ball in there. It's your job as a passer to create the lane for yourself. Create, create the passing lane first. And second, get the ball to the big guy where he can do something with it. In the East, it was Boston, you know, Philly, Milwaukee, and Atlanta was the next team on the rise. And they had an awfully, awfully talented basketball team. And trying to get past them uh, was a tough, tough hurdle. Joe Dumar suited up for his second NBA season. Detroit was focused on breaking past Atlanta. The Hawks finished first in the Central Division that year, with the Pistons five games behind in second place. Then came the playoffs. We won the first round series, and we got into the second round against the Atlanta Hawks. And at that time, at that particular time, Pistons and the Atlanta Hawks 
We're a very even team. And one of those teams were gonna uh, ascend to greater heights, and one would descend. In a tough physical series, the Pistons avenged their 1986 loss and took the 1987 semifinals in five games. We did win a couple of games by maybe one or two points. But I honestly think that that was the difference in us going on to win any world championships and that team not going on to win any world championships. In the Eastern Conference Championships, Detroit faced the defending champion Boston Celtics. Boston was always amazing. If it was springtime and hot and humid, uh, you could rest assured that the heat would be on in the locker room until we got someone to cut it off. Or in the wintertime when it was cold out, I remember so many times it's you know, below freezing, snowing, and we walk in the locker room and the windows are, are cracked open. <laughs> it's like, and even when you shut the windows, it, it takes an hour for it to warm up in there. And that hour is the time that you get in the locker room and get dressed, get ready to play. The Celtics, of course, had dominated the Eastern Conference for years, but the upstart Pistons pushed the series to a seventh game. It was played on a hot, humid day in Boston Garden. And I started thinking about just growing up watching all of these games, watching Boston and Philly and Boston and New York and all those different teams play when I grew up. And, and I was thinking, I can't believe I'm in, I'm in one of these games now. The Celtics and the Pistons slugged it out, and Joe put up 35 points, but Boston wound up winning the game by three points. In 15 postseason contests, Joe Dumars had averaged 13 points and five rebounds. Uh, I think that they expected to win, and we were just happy to be there. Uh, after that, though, I think we realized that happy to be here is not going to get it. The Pistons won 54 games in 1988, and their physical style of play earned them the nickname, the Bad Boys of Basketball. When you walk into the building, it's like, ooh, here come the Pistons, you know, here come the Bad Boys. It was like, when you stepped on the scene, it was like, ooh, there they is. Joe averaged over 14 points a game and finished third on the team in scoring as Detroit won 54 games and its division. In the playoffs, there was only one thing on the bad boys' minds, the Celtics. It's time for these guys to step aside. We're going to the NBA Finals, and they're just a stepping stone in our way. The Pistons were hard, tough, physical, and outlasted the Celtics to take the series four games to two. It was a bitter defeat for the East Premier team. They were the old guard. We were the new guard coming in. Uh, they didn't want to give an inch. We didn't care about giving an inch. His third year in the NBA, Joe Dumars was playing against the Los Angeles Lakers in the NBA Finals. We got into the LA series really quick and developed a, a, a rivalry with the Lakers real quick, simply because of what we had gone through with Boston. And we brought the same attitude to Los Angeles. Detroit pushed the series to seven games, but they lost the final contest by only three points. I can honestly say that after we lost to the Lakers in game seven of the finals, in the locker room, at the Forum in L.A., uh, immediately after the game, the first thing we all looked around and, sit and looked at each other and said was, we're going to win the World Championship next year. If you're going to play the game, you've got to know how to get open. Offensively, when someone is guarding you really tight, or you have the ball and you're trying to make a move to get to the basket or to get free, you have to learn how to get open. Right now, I'm going to talk to you about the V-cut. The V-cut is simply setting the guy up, taking him in one direction, and cutting back hard in the other direction to get open or to get a position to make a layup. Right now, I'll show you two variations of the V-cut. First of all, you pass the ball, and to set the guy up, you have to start going the opposite direction that you really want to go. So I'll take a couple of steps here, and then cut to the basket right here. That's a V-cut when you want to cut inside the guy and take him to the basket. I'll show you one more time. Make the pass, take two steps away, cut to the basket. The other V-cut is just the opposite of that. Take two hard steps to your teammate. You pass the ball to him, two hard steps, then you go with this way right here. The reason that guy has to go with you, if I make the pass to my teammate, and I take two hard steps, and he doesn't go with me, then I can just keep going all the way for a layup. 
That's why that guy has to cut you off. He can't just let you go to the basket free. And that's what sets up the V cut. You want to get open and guys playing you tight, you need some space. Take him two hard steps away from the basket or two hard steps towards the basket and then blast back the other way. That's called a V-cut. Basic fundamental things about screening is uh, you want to get your feet set when you get ready to set a screen. Uh, you want to have your hands in. Uh, you don't want to come down and be moving uh, at the same time that your guy is trying to come off of the screen. You have to be stationary. If you're trying to move and screen the guy at the same time, ref's gonna blow the whistle, it's gonna be a foul automatically. If you slide your feet, if you move, if you put your elbow out, any of that type of movement when you're setting a screen, they're gonna call a foul on you right away. First of all, find out where a guy is. I see where my man is right now that I wanna screen. I see where my teammate is. I'm gonna go down, my teammate's gonna set him up, I'm gonna come to a stop, I'm gonna put my arms just like this. That's to protect myself so the guy, you know, you don't take a really tough blow. You don't wanna come down like this and the guy catches you right here and, and knocks the wind out of you or something. You wanna protect yourself right here and get in a, in a tough position. Both feet are planted firm. You're in a position the ref can't call a foul. You're the guy with the ball, you're the guy with the defender right on you, and now you have to wait for your teammate to come to set the good screen for you before you can take off. Explain to you what just happened. What I do now is when I get here, I'm looking at my teammate. And most of the time, when I'm dribbling the ball over here and I'm in the game, I tell my big guys, don't come up and scream for me until I either make eye contact with you or I nod at you like that. If I nod at you, if I make eye contact with you, that's when I'm ready for you to come. The worst thing that can happen is you get over here, you're trying to get set, and all of a sudden your big guy is there screaming for you already and you're not ready to go. So you wait, you set the guy up, you nod at your big guy, you let him get set, now he's set. Now, what you don't wanna do is this. Create space for that defensive guy to slide through there. You don't wanna go here. What you wanna do is try to go as close as possible to your guy as possible. Try to get as close to him as possible so there's no room for that defensive guy to get through there. Now this big guy has to make a decision. What is he gonna do? Is he gonna guard me? My big guy, I know is gonna roll. Is he gonna guard me or is he gonna, is he gonna try to get back to, to his man? defensive big guy in a bind. He has to make a decision. What is he gonna do? Is it, if, if he goes back, you pull up and shoot the jump shot. If he doesn't go back, you drop the pass in there to your guy rolling. Don't go too soon. Wait till that guy sets the screen. Set him up. Get tight. Remember what I said. Don't create any space like this. That guy, now he can slide through there. Get tight, cut off all the space. Now, now you're at the advantage right there. You catch the ball, someone makes you a pass and you're on the perimeter. First thing you wanna do is get in the triple threat position. We talked about that earlier, but here we are back at it again. I look at the defender. Now, I see the defender, and I see that leg right there right away. Immediately, I see that that leg right there is the leg that's back. So I'm gonna go here and try to attack this other leg. Basically, what I wanna do is attack the front leg. Whatever leg he has up front, now he has this leg up front now. Uh, 
you try to set that guy up and attack that leg there. The reason you want to attack that leg is because it's harder for him to get that leg back than this one right here. This one is already back. He doesn't really have to do anything. It's very easy for him. But if he has whatever leg he has up, you know, he... That's the leg that you tack. I catch the ball, and the defender is right there, and I'm thinking, man, he's too far off for me. I can take a jump shot right here. Or if I catch the ball, and he's right up on me, I'm thinking, man, I can drive on this guy. So it's all about reading the defender when you catch the ball on the perimeter. Look and see what he's doing, and he will dictate to you what you need to do. Oh, well, we got to play the regular season. We have to play these 82 games, and oh, well, we're going to have to play the first, second, and third round of the playoffs. But I guess we have to do all that if we're going to win the world championship, so we better go ahead and do it. Going into the playoffs, the Pistons were focused on beating the Lakers, but the Chicago Bulls were focused on beating the Pistons. The two teams collided in the Eastern Conference Finals, where the job of containing Bulls superstar Michael Jordan rested heavily on guess who? Joe. A, a big plus for me uh, in dealing with Michael and in Chicago at that time was I knew, and he knew, that even if he got by me, there were some very physical guys on my team waiting for him to come in that lane. And uh, matter of fact, they, they kind of wanted me to invite him to come in the lane a lot of times. The Pistons beat the Bulls in six tough games to return to the NBA Finals, where they again faced the Lakers. Detroit took the first two games from L.A., and in game three, Joe Dumars caught fire. I remember saying, I don't care what place you got, just for giving the ball. Joe put up 31 points as the Pistons won 114 to 110. Not a game four. Los Angeles ran up an early 16 point lead, but Detroit stormed back to win the game and their first NBA title. And we swept them. And I, I think that there was no question after that that uh, we were the team in the East. We were the team basically in the NBA at that time. Uh, we just won a world championship the year before, and we came back and swept Boston the year afterwards. You know, I think we were at our height then. He had averaged over 27 points a game in the championship series. Once belittled for not playing football, Joe Dumars now was named most valuable player of the NBA Finals. You start thinking back when I made this decision just to play basketball, thinking about what the teachers and principals and coaches were saying. Are you crazy? What are you doing? You think back about all those decisions that you made to get to this point. And that's what I did. I started thinking back to, to all the decisions and things I had to do to get to that point. And, uh, I think that's what made it so gratifying. Champions at last, the bad boys terrorized the NBA in 1990. After we had won it and proven that we were the best in the world, there was an intimidation factor. Uh, there were situations where we'd come out in the first 10 minutes of the game, be extremely physical, maybe a little fight break out, something like that. And that other team was through. They were through. I mean, we'd end up winning by 20 points. Though Dumars missed two weeks with an injury to his hand, he helped the Pistons win 59 games to finish first in the Central Division. After a tough victory over Chicago in the Conference Finals, Detroit returned to the championship series where they faced the upstart, Portland Trailblazers. I think we expected to face the Lakers again. And uh, Portland just was kind of a surprise and came out of the West. And uh, we ended up facing them. And, I think they probably caught us off guard. The first two games of the 1990 NBA Finals were played in Detroit. The Pistons barely recovered from an early Portland lead to take game one. It was an impossible game. We had no business winning the first game. And then they came back and won the second game. So uh, I think we kind of dug ourselves a little hole right there. Now the significance of the loss was this. Our organization in 17 years, not just during my tenure, had never won a game in the Portland Coliseum. Just before game three began, Thomas and Coach Daly received word that Joe's father had died after a long illness. On the advice of Joe's wife, they decided not to tell him until after the game. I really didn't think the game, as important as it was to me and the rest of the team, was as important not to tell him. But uh, we made the decision, and uh, I still second-guess that thought process. Um, but I also knew, realistically, 
but there wasn't anything Joe could do at that moment. In a way, it's like you were kind of being disloyal because you were holding a secret from a guy that you knew he needed to know, but you had to go out on the court and you had to perform and play with him and watching him play and seeing the things that he was doing, but yet, right after the game, uh, he was gonna have to go in the locker room and break his heart. Detroit got into trouble early as the Trailblazers hit 10 of their first 12 shots. The Dumars led a piston surge in the second half, and Detroit pulled ahead. I'll never forget it, uh, the shot clock was running down, and um, he came across and he shot one, and it had to, you know, go way, 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 way up to the sky. And, you know, the ball just kind of like gravitated and flowed and looked like everything went in slow motion, you know, and it, and it just dropped and hit the bottom of the net. And uh, I just said to myself that, you know, his dad made that one. The Pistons had broken their 17-year-old Portland jinx and beat the Trailblazers 121 to 106. Joe Dumars played his best game of the series and was Detroit's leading scorer of the night. After the game, uh, just walking back, once I got to the locker room, uh, coaches and uh, the general manager asked me to step outside and uh, come into a, another room, another part of the arena. And I thought it was for an interview or something. Just three minutes after leading the Pistons to their greatest upset in years, Joe Dumars learned that his father had passed away. Uh, the owner of the team, we drove to the hotel, and uh, he said he had a plane waiting for me. He had his jet waiting for me. He was going to fly me straight to Louisiana right after the game. Uh, this is a Sunday. We were up 2-1. Game four was going to be played Tuesday. Game five was going to be played Thursday. <clears throat> if we win both of those games, we win the series 4-1. If not, we have to go back to Detroit uh, and play game six and seven. So I called home and I called my mom and I talked to her and I said, well, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna catch a flight right now and come home. And she said, no, don't, don't do that. And I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, I'm gonna schedule uh, your father's funeral for Friday. And if you guys win Tuesday and win Thursday, you don't have to miss any games, but you gotta win Tuesday or Thursday. On Tuesday, the Pistons won by three points on Thursday. They won by two and captured their second consecutive NBA crown. We won the world championship again. Everybody's happy. Everybody's pouring champagne and drinking champagne. And it was a funny feeling because I wanted to do that. We won the world championship, but it was kind of hard to do it, knowing that I was going to get on the plane in about four or five hours and go to my father's funeral. Joe Dumars Jr., dad, had always told his sons that there were no excuses for avoiding responsibility. If he would have even thought that I was talking about missing, missing games and basically what he would say is missing work, uh, <laughs> he wouldn't have had that. So uh, that was another thing that helped me stay and, and do what I had to do. When you're at the two guard like I am in the NBA, every single night you're facing somebody who's either the leading scorer or the second leading scorer. Usually he's one of the go-to guys. Usually he's one of the marquee guys. What I'm saying is you're playing against a great player every single night that you step on the floor. So if you're not ready to play defense, if you don't have the will to play defense, you're going to have a lot of long nights in the NBA playing a two-guard position. I have the ball. I turn. My guy is on me. If you look at the defensive guys, if you look at this defensive guy over here, he's in the passing lane right now. I cannot make a simple pass right there. He's playing off the ball, but he's in great defensive position because he's not allowing an easy pass just to go to the offensive guy. Same thing on this side over here. I have the ball, I can't make the easy pass. These guys are in great defensive position off the ball. Defense on the ball. This guy is square, his knees are bent, arms are out. This is great position for defense on the ball right here. There's some movement though. When the ball is being moved around the court, these three guys on defense should all be like on a string. They should all move together. I make the pass. Watch to see what happens. He drops on, on defense. He squares the guy up. He's not going to let the guy drive. My guy, he drops back automatically. He's in great help position. The weak side guy, he's in great defensive help position. Now the ball comes back up top. Watch the defense. 
they all move together. This defensive man comes back up. He denies the pass. The guy on the ball moves up. He's not going to let me drive. The guy on this side now, he moves back up. Let's say I make the pass over here now. Look at the movement. He squares the guy up, gets in front of the guy, does not let him drive. My guy drops back. He's ready to help in case he gets beat. The weak side guy, in case the guy drives baseline, he's ready to step over and help. This is what you call good defense on the ball and off the ball. Defense is all about will. If you're a guard, if you're a point guard, if you're a two guard, defense starts with you guys. It starts with guys who are out on the perimeter. If you allow your man to break the defense down, if you allow the perimeter people from the other team to be able to break you down night in and night out, that's going to put so much pressure on your team defense until you're going to be in the hole every single night. After you win a world championship a couple of times, you kind of get this feeling that it's yours. There's nobody else's. You kind of own it, and um, it's yours to do with what you want to do with. But you know, it's not the case. 1991, the Bulls eliminated the Pistons in the Eastern Conference Finals, went on to win their first championship of the 90s. They finally got up enough courage and enough energy and, and mental, you know, stamina to beat the crap out of us. In 1992, the Pistons were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs by the New York Knicks. In 1993, the Pistons failed to make the playoffs for the first time in Joe's career. In 1994, four years after reaching the top of the basketball mountain, the once mighty Pistons lost 62 games and won only 20. 20 and 62 is, uh, is, is definitely the valley. Uh, you can't get any lower than that. Joe had a brief respite from his woes in Detroit when he was selected for Dream Team 2. Dream Team 2, we played the World Championships in Toronto. Um, some great young talent on that team. I, I enjoyed that team. I had a lot of fun on that team. Dumars was one of the three captains of a squad that included Shaquille O'Neal, Reggie Miller, and Alonzo Mourning. Playing eight games in 11 days, Dream Team 2 easily won the gold medal. You have people waving the United States flag. Uh, you, you tend to take a little bit more pride in what you're doing then. Uh, I, I didn't know if I believed it before. After going through Dream Team 2, I believe it now. Meantime, back in Detroit with longtime captains Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer retired, Dumars was now asked to lead the Pistons. When you're the youngest uh, growing up in your family, when you're the youngest on your team for several years, uh, I think eventually you become, you, you become a person who want to be the oldest at some point. You want to be looked at as, as, the, as the veteran guy or the, or the big brother. And uh, I welcomed that because I had been on the other end of that my entire life. By 1996, Detroit had begun to rebuild on the strength of young players like Grant Hill, and the Pistons made it back to the playoffs. It was a great accomplishment for us to get back because when you're going through those real, real dark periods like we did for a couple of years, you start wondering if you're ever going to get back to see playoff-type basketball and that type of excitement again. As a boy, Joe Dumars was taught never to make excuses. As an NBA player, he rarely had to. In years of glory and in years of defeat, he never failed to do what was demanded, and he did it with a professional grace that makes him a basketball all-star. My whole thing has been, when I come here, I'm going to give you 100% every day and every night, and you can expect that from me from start to finish. And that's how I want to finish up. Uh, I want to finish up people knowing that they could always depend on me. I'd be there always. These drills that we just went over are basic fundamentals of the game. These are the drills that are either going to make you or break you. If you're trying to be a great player, if you're trying to reach the next level, try these drills. Good luck to you guys. I'll see you guys on the court.